So what are we going to talk about tonight? So as a quick overview, um, we're going to be touching on the purpose of this no zone document and this no zone rule. Um, and what is it? Then I'm going to go down a path of defining what a zone actually is. Um, and then we're going to dive into some X's and O's, uh, how you can prove whether something is a zone defense or not. The upcoming guidelines and implementation that Basel New South Wales is going to be implementing as well as some resources and plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm also gonna have some video to support some of um, my X's and O's, and I'm gonna play them at low speed. So hopefully the lag isn't too affected on your end. Again, if there's any questions, please do not stop me. All right, now the purpose. It was, it was really interesting. Um, a couple of decades ago, Basketball Australia already did the research on an under-14 club nationals, and they tracked teams in, at under-14s that played zone a lot compared to teams that didn't play zone very regularly. And what they found was that players who were coming from a uh, an association and a team that played zone consistently, they found that their players weren't really set up for success to then play at the next level. Now, what next level is that? If you're coaching at a domestic level, then representative basketball is really the next level to um, get your kids to succeed. If you're a representative coach, then really the goal is to prepare them for the state sporting organization or even college beyond that if they have no luck making a representative team or sorry, being in a representative team, making a school team, and they're not being able to have a chance to make a state team. If kids are playing for New South Wales, then really our job is to develop them and handball them off to uh, Australian junior teams. Now, the Australian research they did at previous under-14 club nationals were that kids that, again, came from consistent zone play, they found that their kids weren't having the opportunity or the shot to represent not only their state, but to represent Australia as well. So if we're going to do our job as coaches at a representative level, it's it's only right that we provide them the due diligence and set them up to succeed by playing man-to-man -man defense. Now, what I mean by that, I don't mean that you're not allowed to run a full court or half court trap. That is still within a man-to-man -man defense. What we are saying is don't, uh, I shouldn't say don't, but refrain from teaching your junior teams how to play zone at an under 14's age and younger. Um, now, by discouraging these junior teams from playing zone, we don't want to punish um, individuals who might be lazy, who don't, who don't understand man-to-man um, -man defense just yet, are simply tired or just have poor coaching in front of them. That is not the point of the rule. The point of the rule is to set them up for success. So not only are we putting our athletes in a position where they understand man-to-man -man principles and they are held accountable to those rules, but it's also from the perspective of the coach to understand and uh, how to learn how to teach man-to-man -man defense and really put our players in a position to succeed. Now, defining zone. There are different zones out there for those that have played at a domestic level or are still playing now, guilty, then you'll know that you'll play zone very regularly. And if you're playing zone at those levels, you know, it's easier to just come back and set up. Mm -hmm. um, you're really just uh, putting yourself in a position to guard an area and you are responsible for the ball and the player once it gets in your area. Now, as demonstrated by row A, you'll notice different formations of zones. So in, in the first column on the left, we have a 2-3 or a 2-1-2, dependent on how high X5 is standing. We also have a 1-2-2 two, two, or a 3-2, which is very common to uh, play against a zone defense against a team that has very good shooters. And then you have a 1-3-1, one, one, a different formation to keep the ball out of the high post and really... Uh, deter any penetration through wings and down the middle of the floor. So there are different kinds of zones. And as you can see in row B, different kinds of zones look after different areas of the floor. So if we were to look after a one-two-two zone, 
then you can see here that zone one is really looked after by the plane in that area. Zone three, zone two, by X2 and X3, and then zone five and zone four by the two players at the back. You could also see similar principles, uh, similar principles in other zones. And this was great work drawn up by Hills Basketball Association in their zone versus man-to-man -man document. So if you wanna understand more, there are definitely a lot of public documents out there that can teach you about what defines a zone. Now, why would coaches run it? Number one thing, it's preventing the basketball from going into a particular area of the court. So let's just take the two, three zone, for example, this one in A on the left. We'll use that as an example. The number one thing it's supposed to do is it's supposed to prevent pass and dribble penetration within the key. So if you're preventing pass and dribble penetration within the key, it's going to encourage teams to shoot. Now, if teams are going to shoot, you can definitely see that there are players already in advantageous positions to get the rebound. So it really helps prevent key penetration and puts your players in a position to rebound the basketball. So not only are they responsible for the player and the ball within their area, but one of the problems with the zone is that sometimes you could be in an area where there is zero players or could be multiple players. That's not good. So by the time they move on to uh, a man-to-man -man defense and they don't understand the concepts of one covering two or I'm not guarding anyone, I need to scramble and find someone, then that is why the fundamentals of man-to-man -man defense is essential to teach. The other thing that zone defense could do, it could cause you to be passive. And I'm sure you've seen it, coaches. You've coached a game, you've, you've encouraged your team very loudly to get up the court and apply pressure and everyone runs back to the key, turns around and calls out, I've got number one. And then next minute, they call out number one and then they're guarding number seven. You said you were going to guard number one. Why are you guarding number seven? I'm not sure, coach. Okay, so when we're playing man-to-man -man defense, you're automatically putting yourself into a more assertive style of pressure. So by teaching kids full court man, uh, you will make a layup. And instead of kids running backwards, setting up their zone, they could run forwards, find their player immediately and start to apply ball pressure uh, once the opponents are ready to inbound the ball. That is exactly what we're trying to achieve and the fundamentals that we're trying to instill. The other thing that that zone deters offensively, it allows limited development for offense. So if you're taking away key penetration, there's, prob there's probably limited opportunity for pass penetration towards a low post. There is hopefully limited penetration towards a high post by the pass. And there's a lot of walls in front of you if you were to do any dribble penetration. Now, you could argue, but Jared, you could still do that against a zone. I completely hear you. But we're not putting in this rule to develop the offense. We're putting in this rule to develop the defense and set our kids up for future success. So trying to hold them accountable to understand where is the basketball? Where is my player? I need to stand in this spot because uh, these are the reasons that it's advantageous for my team, whether it's a rebounding position, being on split line because the ball's on the other side, being in a re rebounding position to box out on the weak side, whatever it may be. By playing man-to-man -man defense, you can still mix up your man so that you can show other options to the opposing team would like double teaming, face guarding and denying, playing full court man, playing half court man, and even playing little half court traps. Now, how are we gonna prove whether an opponent is running a zone or not? Now you can see in diagram A, diagram A is clearly showing a two, three or a two, one, two zone. All five players, outside the three-point line. And uh, this looks like the uh, the Penrith NBL1 men's team trying to shoot threes without any rebounders in position. We're doing our best. We are doing our best. So we, uh, rather than setting ourselves outside the three-point line, we need to prove whether a team is playing a zone or not. In diagram B, you'll see that 04, player four, is cutting through the key. And we're noticing whether the defense is moving or not. The other important 
piece of terminology that you need to understand about man-to-man -man defense is split line. So this line is not on every basketball court in the world. It is simply an invisible line that splits the court perfectly in half. The use of split line is incredibly helpful defensively. So what you're seeing in diagram C, you're seeing, excuse me, you're seeing X2 guard O2 applying ball pressure. You're seeing X3 and X1 appropriately guard O1, one pass away. And by the looks of it, they're in a flat triangle. So they're getting ready to stop dribble penetration. And then we have O4 on the other side of the floor and we have O5 on the other side of the floor. X5 and X4 don't need to stand all the way on the three-point line to guard their player. They can simply stand on split line in case X2 and X3 or X1 gets beaten off pass or dribble penetration. That way, X4 and X5 can be prepared to stop any easy baskets, the layup. Now, to further prove whether an opponent is playing zone, sometimes the plays on split, split line don't have to move. So, for example, in diagram D, O3 has the basketball and decides to pass uh, to the corner where O4 is standing. O5 is on the opposite block with X5 guarding O5. If that is the case, X5 is in a low split position. So if O3 was to pass to O4, they don't need to move. Probably the only thing they need to move is their eyes, just to make sure they know where the basketball is. Because if anyone here is coached under eights, you know exactly where their eyes go. Now in diagram E, we have more movement that's helpful for the defense. O4 has decided to penetrate. They've beaten X4. They were tied, whatever. They've penetrated. Then X5 has done their job on low split to commit to the basketball and prevent the layup at the risk of losing their player O5. That is worth the risk. It is better to make the opposition pass than to shoot a basket and score two points. That allows other teammates time to scramble, find new matchups, and then hopefully prevent, hopefully prevent another easy basket. In diagram F, we have an example of a ball reversal and X5 not being required to move. So they're not playing zone. So O4 reverses via O1 to O3. And then X5 is just getting to the other side of the post because obviously in this team, they want to play away from the post. So X5 in that scenario doesn't need to move, does not need to move. They're still in the correct spot. So what can you do? What can you do to ensure that the defense is moving and not playing zone? Let me show you coaches. Follow me. In diagram G, O4 has the ball on the wing. O5 has now decided to flash cut across to the same side low post. X5 is now following them because O5 is conducting a type of cut. The, cut. the type of cut that is demonstrated in diagram G is known as a flash cut. They're flashing towards the basketball. So X5 in that scenario would bump the cutter and then get into their appropriate post defensive stance, whether it is all the way behind half fronting or full fronting, whatever it may be, X5 is then put in the effort to guard their man to prevent them from getting a catch, dependent on what you want to do defensively. If you want O5 to catch, so be it, and they're not a threat. In a diagram H, you can see O5, then instead of going to the post, clearing out, clearing out all the way to the perimeter. Now, X5 might initially bump the cutter and prevent them from going to the low post. But if they keep on going, they don't need to follow them all the way out to the three-point line. They can just put themselves in a one-pass-away stance. So in a one-pass-away, if they were standing right there, like it was demonst like demonstrated in diagram I, just pretend X5 would be where X3 is. That would be one pass away in a flat triangle. So they are following man-to-man -man principles all simply by sending a cutter through and seeing what the defense does. Now, I want to show you on video, this is a, uh, a European under-13s game. So these kids are top age 14s, um, and they're playing at an invitational tournament in 2018, 
And as you can see down below, it's the Frenchy Phenoms. I'm sure that's a club, not their junior national team, versus Real Madrid's um, under-13s. And I just want you to pay attention to the defensive side. Um, this game is fascinating. It looks like it looks like they're playing with a size five. Um, and well done. Well done to our competitions for making that adjustment. It looks like they're playing on lowered rings. I can definitely dump that. That's giving me plenty of hope. And if you notice defensively, all these French juniors, they're marking their play and they're responsible for one person. So if I pause it right here, this blonde boy uh, away from the basketball, he realizes that his, his player is two passes away. So he doesn't need me to be all the way up close. So he's preparing himself to load up on split line. And he's got his eyes regularly on the basketball. Oh, not much split line defense there. That was obviously a rule. And now watch the Spanish kids. Oh, well, they got a steal. Good on the Spanish. Oh, oh, foul. I'm playing this in slow motion, so hopefully it does not. All right, inbounds play, playing in slow motion. Great. So watching the weak side defense on split line, one pass away, they were prepared. And just look at the accountability that man-to-man -man teaches these individual players. It teaches them not only to box out their player and be responsible for it, because in a zone, you might have no plays in your area, so you don't have to box out anyone. Mm. On the weak side, you've got to be responsible for boxing out your player. If you watch number 34 here, he's trying to do a good job securing inside position. He might not be held accountable to those rules against his own. Number two, this boy in the corner forgot to box out his player. And no surprise, Real Madrid get the offensive rebound. But fantastic uh, fundamental habits by these French juniors getting down in stance. The Spanish kids obviously very brave to shoot it and holding his, uh, each other accountable to box out. He's obviously a very strong boy. And that looks like Victor Wimbanyama at 12 years old. Another foul. All right, let me fast forward in the action coaches. All right, watching the Spanish kids play defense. So as you can see, just watching their eyes, this kid has his chin on his shoulder, checking where the ball is. These boys are sprinting back and they're scrambling. Number nine is obviously already committed towards a basket. And then this boy at the back is obviously getting ready to protect the layup. So all the Spanish kids are prepared uh, and understand where their player is at all times. And as you can see, look at this Spanish boy's eyes. He's not so much on low split, but he's at least paying attention to the ball and in the right area to guard his player. If he was to run back into a zone, then he would just run back to the spot, then find his player next. In man-to-man, -man, you've got to do the opposite in some, in some instances. So the help didn't really help. They're obviously trying to teach their kids to guard the basketball as best as they can. All right, and then the French kids doing a good job, sprinting back, trying to contain the layup. Wide open jump shot. This number 34 is doing a good job boxing out. Now, in a zone, in a zone, here's, here's a coach teaching a zone to juniors. Please don't judge. It doesn't matter. It's actually good that someone's doing that so we can have a discussion. The ball is up top with number 26. The offense is in a five-out alignment. Now, if I just play this video, you'll notice that the player guarding the ball has left a massive island of two green players to be guarded by one player. And then this poor bloke underneath the rim, he doesn't have much to do besides to watch the ball and hope he gets the rebound. So as the ball moves around, you'll notice that one player is holding a count to guarding the basketball. Everyone is guarding their zone. And there's not much intensity. You can still be aggressive in the zone. There's not much intensity, but it's still leaving this guy on an island. If we were to use man-to-man -man principles, then this person would be responsible for one of these two people on the perimeter rather than already being in a rebounding position now if we continue the action now we have a large disadvantage with three players against two we have three defenders on the ball 
But if this kid saw the action, he might throw it to the other side immediately if he's strong enough. And then that would create more havoc for this disadvantage to create an easy basket. So this is what a zone defense would look like if you were to play it in juniors. But it doesn't hold the defense accountable to what we need to teach them, which is guard the basketball, understand where you need to stand in relation to where your player in the ball is, be ready to box out. And if a basket does go in for us, be prepared to play full court, man. That is very assertive and applies pressure on the opposition. Now, guidelines to the rule implementation and how would you approach this as a coach to a game? Um, coaches, please remember we're dealing with humans first. So introductions to each game. I'm not expecting you to be extroverted at every game, but before you start coaching a game, please introduce yourself to the opposing coach, to the referees, and then make sure you identify who the court supervisor is. Now, the guidelines will be uh, will be released in the next week in a bit, and they will be sent to your club delegate. Now, when they're sent to your club delegate, a zone buster will be a competent individual within the stadium, whether it's an experienced coach or a competent court supervisor who has the ability to identify a zone to then come watch the game, to follow the guidelines to watch. This will also be be a doc document to share once published with your delegates. Then once the zone buster is watching the game, there could be a warning to the coach to make sure that they're teaching the athletes to play man. If there, is an, if there is an athlete who is just struggling to play man, then all we can ask for is the effort. Are they looking in the right spot? Is the coach coaching them to be in the right position? Are they putting in the effort to guard the ball? Because I'm sure you've all seen it. I'm, all sh I'm sure you've seen the five foot 11 under 12 kid who can barely move their feet and move like a baby giraffe. So for those kids, it can be very exhausting to move and their legs, leg muscles must be so tight, but at least is the coach putting in the effort to teach them how to play man to man. There could be a warning. It could result in a tech. And if there are uh, reoccurring penalties over a series of games, then there's a three strike rule. At the end of those three strikes, there needs to be video evidence submitted to association delegates and Basketball New South Wales. And then throughout that video evidence, it will be determined whether an opposition coach is playing zone or not. Um, and then reasons for it will be, um, will be taught to the coach. And then uh, if, it can, if there is a continuation to offend, then... Um, it's more serious action will need to be taken place. All these details will be released within the guidelines and implementation policies. So please keep an eye out in the next week and a bit. Now, resources that can help you. Here are some fantastic resources. We did not need to do any further work about no zone clinics or how to teach man to man. The top two videos I highly recommend, former AIS basketball coach, coach Ian Stacker does a fantastic man-to-man um, -man defensive clinic and he has been running no zone workshops around Victoria for years so he, they recorded one and I recommend the watch once you get the opportunity I will share these PowerPoint slides with you but if you just google these workshops uh, these workshops in the YouTube you'll certainly find them FIBA has a great um, teaching man-to-man -man defense with Dwayne Casey the ex Detroit Pistons and Toronto Raptors coach and Lono has some fantastic defensive clinics on uh, drills for teaching your defense and individual defense. To also direct your attention, Basketball Australia has a fantastic coaches resource page where they can, uh, where you can find a whole bunch of videos and articles to do with defense. And last but not least, one of the most valuable resources, the FIBA World Association of Basketball Coaches resource. At this page, it dissects with a lot of clarity uh each kind of concept and skill in order to give you uh, a healthy base and fundamental and foundation to then go on and teach your athletes so all very very helpful resources all very helpful resource resources to begin your learning journey um coaches that's that's it in relation to the presentation if you have any questions on any of that, 
please either yourself or slap it the um slap it in the chat. All right, here come the questions. Great, great, great. All right, why not keep no zone for at least under 16s and possibly under 18s? Matt, fantastic question. Um, at under 16s and under 18s, that's when they begin to uh, create the junior national Australian teams. And if, if these kids are going to have an idea of how to play zone, at some stage, that rule needs to break where coaches are now allowed to play zone. So... In relation to under 16s and under 18s, by the time kids get to an under 16 age groups, they need to learn how to play the game. So now that they would hopefully have had multiple years of playing against a man to man, playing against a zone is just all about identifying gaps and taking advantage uh, and finding the advantages and attacking them. So at under 16s, we can really teach the kids how to play. Then under 18s, we can really refine and prepare the kids on, on teaching them how to win. So at under 16s, if they're making the first state team, they'll definitely face a zone at a, at a uh, nationals. And then if kids are lucky enough to make the junior national teams, they will definitely face it at, at FIBA national international tournaments. So uh, it's important at some stage that we then begin to teach kids zone, but for under 14s and under, under 12s, it's important that we try our best to stick with man. Now, any issues with a press from coach Steve Kennedy? No coach, no issues with a full court press or a half court trap at all. The, the only condition is that it falls back into a man to man. So you could do a full court and you could do an arrow press where you double team the ball on the catch. You could do a delay press where you could double team the ball on the first dribble or on the next pass, or as soon as the ball um, crosses halfway, or you could do a press in the half court, but once it's broken, then you're going back into man. Um, that stuff is fine because at the end of the day, if you play a full court press, it is only lasting for eight seconds. Uh, we're, we're merely asking coaches, please don't play zone consistently. So as a result, we're saying no zone at all in the half court. In the full court, completely fine. So press, no stress. Oh, that rhymes. There you go. New saying. I should trademark that. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. So issues with the press, no. Um, awesome, awesome. Any other questions, coaches, please, please feel free. Otherwise, uh, that's the presentation, coaches. Um, ah, do you have... Coach Mike has a question. Do you have any comments on presses in preseason? Look, presses will get you a lot of wins, coaches, because you'll get steal, 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 bucket, bucket, bucket. I have two things if you're thinking long term. One, um, there, there are simple press breakers to teach your kids. Mm -hmm. You could waste a lot of preseason time teaching your kids presses and press breaks where it would last longer if you started to teach your kids how to um, how to jump, stop, pivot, make right-hand and left-hand layups, how to shoot, how to read um, a closeout. So there are a lot of fundamentals in preseason to teach. Um, now, if you're teaching presses in preseason, you are going to get a lot of wins. But the only question I throw back on you now is are you really setting up your team for long-term success because there's a couple of things. If you show your press in preseason, you're showing opposing coaches what your press is anyway. Easy to coach against. We can do that in training later because preseason tournaments don't mean anything. Right. Uh, next, if, if you do show a preseason press, then that will give opposing coaches time to do press breaks later on. And then, You've, you've wasted all that time. You've wasted all that time teaching all this press break and then you're still throwing turnovers and you could have just done, spent all that time practicing passing, finishing, jump stopping, getting into the right spots. So um, if I was to do juniors again, I, I wouldn't waste, I personally wouldn't waste time on teaching a press, but I would do double teams and denials and face guards. 
So, for example, everyone is guarding their player. Everyone's guarding their player. As soon as the ball is inbounded, the person guarding the inbounder, go double team the ball. Go do that. Once they get out of it, just go back to your player. Rather than setting up a shape like a one two one one arrow press. Um, and you can even face guard opponents. So just get in a full denial. You'll get plenty of steals that way. And you'll also develop these kids that are very good how to get themselves open off full denial. So um, I'm sorry, Coach Mike, I could talk about that um, for hours, but but that is what my gut tells me I will do next time I go to juniors. Uh, it is recorded, Coach. And uh, Emma, I've seen you have, I've seen you have uh, answered it already. In regards to offense, is a zone okay? Coach Jess, can you please unmute yourself and un unpack that a little bit? What do you mean in regards to offense, is a zone okay? Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Um, I had under 12 boys and getting them, um, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to set them up in like a two, one, two, sorry, like a, you know, two on the base, three at the top offense. I wasn't sure if that was a zone, but I wasn't sure if I could, um, if I was allowed, because I know zone was discouraged. I didn't realize it was defensive only. Yeah. So should I be setting them up with two on the base and three at the top or is that? And are you talking about offensively? Yeah, offensively. That, that's completely up to you. So if you put them in specific spots, if you put them in specific spots in um, offense, then that might be determined as a set. Um, but we're, we're really talking from a defensive perspective. So um, we're trying to refrain coaches from teaching and putting their kids in a um, defensive spot in a zone, but what you do offensively is completely up to you, you mate. So to answer your question, um, there there are zone offenses and there are zone offenses that can work against man-to-man -man defense. So if, if you Google zone offense, you'll be able to find some offenses, but I'm not sure how effective those zone offenses would work against a man because they were designed to play against a zone defense. Yep, yep, cool. Thank you. Right. No worries at all, mate. Yeah. All right. I think that's it for the questions from what I can see, coaches. Thank you so much for spending the time on a Tuesday night. I'm sure you want to get back to home and away or Wheel of Fortune or just dinner and looking after the kids. I cannot thank your effort enough for everything, not only that you do for the game, for yourself and for your communities. It is very, very highly appreciated. Um, and the quality of basketball in this state is improving, all thanks to people like you. So keep up the fantastic work. I wish you all the best for this upcoming season. And please, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to talk to another coach at your association. Talk to another coach within your community at another association. Reach out to BNSW or just chat to a state coach that is close to you or a high performance coach. Let's keep up these conversations, coaches, and let's keep getting better. Thanks so much for what you do and um, I'll see you soon.